Hugo Chavez was, uh, you know, the most important Venezuela leader of the last century. It's really uh, difficult to overstate his importance. Uh, not only was he an incredible political leader, a naturally talented political leader, but he was also an intellectual, really just a massive uh, impact on raising people's consciousness and their level of understanding of their society. Chavez always had a strategy and a plan. And even though he behaved often very impulsively, he always had a, an end game. I mean, he knew where he was going, whereas with Maduro, it, it's, it's just chaos. I'm your host, Husna Rizvi, and you're listening to the first episode of Contested Legacies, the show where I excavate, scrap over, and examine the legacies of influential political icons. Now, it's no secret that Latin America is seeing an intense right-wing resurgence, with leaders ranging from sympathetic to outright nostalgic for the military dictatorships of the 1970s and 80s that purged people in their thousands. A leader who openly repudiated those decades of continent-wide repression and neoliberal economics? Hugo Chavez, Venezuela's 45th president, first elected in 1998 with a whopping 56% of the vote. Chavez's election marked the beginning of the so-called Pink Tide, a decade that saw left-wing governments crop up all over the continent. Known for nationalising and redistributing Venezuela's abundant oil wealth, Chavez is also credited with reducing inequality and building a welfare state for the nation's poor, particularly the rural and indigenous people who had been left out of politics for so long. Some call it the Bolivarian Revolution, others label it petro-populism, a cynical ploy to cement popularity within a mass movement. Today, six years after his death, Venezuela has now experienced its latest bout of a deeply entrenched power struggle. The conflict is complex, but is roughly between the US-backed opposition in charge of the Congress and Chavismo, the grassroots mass movement that demanded Chavez be reinstated after an unsuccessful US-supported coup in 2002. In the background is an ongoing economic crisis caused by the collapse in oil prices, currency mismanagement and US sanctions. Chavez's Bolivarian revolution is a case study in fundamental questions. Do the people of the global south have the right to sovereignty over their natural resources? And how can political power and political will be maintained so that that might be so? And most importantly, even when you've checked all those boxes, what do you do when the global market price for your most valuable resource slumps? Well, let's rewind a bit. Hugo Chavez Frias was born in 1954 in the Barina state, a place largely untouched by the nation's oligarchic-owned oil wealth. His political education started early, in military school, where legend has it he had very little actual fighting to do, operated the radio, and began a study group using Marxist texts he found in a burned-out car on his first mission after graduating, ironically to capture and arrest guerrillas. Riled up by the lack of class struggle in front of him, the young Chavez writes in his diary, "'My people are stoical, passive.' Who will light the flame? We could raise a fire, but the wood is wet. The conditions aren't right. But Chavez was no pacifist. So what did he think about armed revolutions? And what's Simon Bolivar got to do with it? To help me map out the ideology of Chavismo is my first guest, George Chicarello Mar, a political theorist who wrote the book on revolutionary movements in Venezuela called We Created Chavez, A People's History on the Venezuelan Revolution. George, thanks for coming on the show. I wanted to explore the ideological underpinnings of Chavismo. A good place to start is Bolivar. What's the significance of Bolivarianism to the Chavista movement? And why is he such an important figure? Part of what I think is important to understand about contemporary Venezuela, about Chavismo, is that this was not about Chavez himself. Um, and, and I've made that point you know, repeatedly in a lot of my work, um, and instead have sought to, to look further back um, to grasping the origins and the dynamics of the movement. Um, you know, Chavez, of course, emerged in a 1992 coup. Uh, and then if you go further back to find the sources of that coup, uh, you find a mass rebellion, which was now 30 years ago in 1989, called the Caracaso. And if you go further back from that, you find the expansion of uh, urban movements uh, that, you know, that had their origins in the late armed struggle in the 1970s and 1980s. And it's that entire trajectory that we need to grasp and understand 
if we're going to understand not only the the origins of Chavismo, but its parameters, the kind of new democracy that it sought to craft, um, as well as the tactics and the strategies that it learned often by uh, by failure. Um, it's in that armed struggle, in the late stages of that armed struggle, uh, that we find the emergence of this idea of Bolivarianism. Um, Simon Bolivar, of course, is a great liberator of Latin America, also a very fraught figure who was dismissed by Marx himself um, as a sort of you know, bourgeois, you know, uh, uh, and irrelevant uh, to actual socialist and communist struggles. Um, but part of what the lessons of the, the armed struggle in Venezuela um, had, had to do with the fact that too often uh, leftists in Venezuela were seeking uh, foreign sources for inspiration. They were looking to Marx, they were looking to Marxist in Europe, um, and they were simply looking elsewhere for models of revolution. And that led them to failure very often. Um, and so not only did Bolivar uh, you know, re-emerge uh, in the process of a search for local uh, not only Venezuelan, but Latin American inspirations and revolutionary figures, but Bolivarianism came to name, in a way, that process. Bolivarianism could be understood as the framework for rethinking revolution based on local conditions, drawing upon indigenous history, drawing upon Afro-Venezuelan history. All of this um, began to emerge and proliferate, particularly in the 1970s and 80s, under the banner of Bolivar and Bolivarianism. Today, Venezuela is surrounded by far-right governments, Bolsonaro in Brazil and Ivan Duque in Colombia. What did Chavez do when he was alive to mobilize the left internationally? So if we understand Chavismo as a, uh, you know, as, as part of a much broader dynamic, what we can say is that uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, neoliberalism essentially took over Latin America, imposed by the United States and elsewhere. In other words, it, it emerged prior to its emergence in full force in the U.S. and in the U.K. with Thatcher and Reagan. It was being tested out in Latin America. Now, the movements that exploded in the, in the late 80s, but particularly in the 90s across the continent, um, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, and in Venezuela, um, that propelled uh, Evo Morales, Rafael Correa, and Hugo Chavez to power um, were reactions against neoliberalism, neoliberalism in attempts to build something very different. It led to uh, what we now call the pink tide. In other words, an anti, a broadly anti-neoliberal resurgence of the left that ended up in power across most of the continent and created as a result and strategically uh, created institu institutions of regional uh, cooperation so that if uh, Argentina, for example, wanted to cut off as it did, wanted to you know, reduce its dependence on uh, sort of uh, these sort of vulture institutions like the IMF and the World Bank um, that had imposed structural adjustment, they could get loans from Venezuela, Brazil, and others to do so through these regional lending institutions. They sought to build regional uh, economic cooperation and regional political cooperation that would allow for the consolidation uh, of a broad network of support for these left-wing projects in the region against U.S. hegemony and against the right. Now, to, to every you know, action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, which has been the mobilization of the right, um, which took a while, um, and it took some strategic refinement by the Latin American far right, um, a right that had been, of course, associated with the most reactionary elements, the most racist elements, the most capitalist and brutal and dictatorial elements. Um, but they've managed to, piece by piece, pull apart this leftist unity in the region uh, through coups, um, followed by elections, for example, in, in Brazil, uh, you know, soft coups in Paraguay, um, uh, you know, overt coups in Honduras, elections in Argentina, in, uh, you know, in Colombia and elsewhere. Um, they've really been able to reconstitute a right-wing hegemony in the region. Um, and when you look at, again at what some of these people stand for, it's some of the most brutal sort of Pinochet-style far-right anti-poor politics. It stands for the cleansing of not only um, you know, not only poor black and brown people, but also of communists, of intellectuals, and of those on the left. Um, and so uh, Latin America confronts, I think, a, a tipping point, um, and, and there's still time to tip it back, but it's incredibly frightening. What are the dangers facing Chavismo at the moment? Uh, the danger is that a great deal of the mass energy of Chavismo has been exhausted and sapped by economic crisis, uh, certainly also by a certain amount of frustration with uh, the political leadership um, and the fact that, uh, you know, they haven't seen enough uh, in terms of improvement of the economic situation. Um, you know, certainly corruption exists. It has always existed in Venezuela. And, 
but the, the unfortunate fact is that in the context of an economic crisis, when you see people, some people in the government or some military officials doing very well, that also makes you wonder whether or not, uh, you know, whether or not you're living in a, in a truly revolutionary and experiencing a truly revolutionary movement. Um, and, and so the government needs to, you know, desperately not only stabilize the macroeconomic situation, but also search for ways to revitalize mass participation in the Bolivarian movement. Um, it's been an incredibly participatory movement in which mass uh, you know, revolutionary movements on the grassroots level have been able to have a huge impact on government policy, on radicalizing uh, the political process. That connection needs to be reestablished. Last question. How should we understand Hugo Chavez's legacy? Uh, you know, the impact of Chavez politically is best understood in the sense that he didn't simply occupy a political position on an established spectrum in Venezuela. He and in again, hand in hand with movements and revolutionary struggles in the streets, were able to shift the entire political spectrum. Uh, to the left, and this is no small feat. Um, and so, this is uh, these are the, the, the sort of parameters for what's you know really crucial about grasping his long-term and lasting importance. And in terms of what that stood for, we're talking about, of course, social equality and social welfare. Um, but he was not a social democrat. He was, uh, by the end, in particular, by you know a few years into his first term, uh, a decidedly revolutionary thinker um, who sought to radically transform not only people's living standards. Um, this was not Brazil. This was not Argentina, but the participatory nature of their relationship with the government. And so he, he made a speech called the golpe de timón, or the, the shift of course, or the strike at the helm, depending on how you translate it. And what it what his legacy um, that he laid out in that speech was, was what he calls the communes. In other words, the radical decentralization of political power into participatory institutions on the grassroots level, where people directly and democratically govern their own lives, govern local production, um, and do so in popular assemblies. In other words, where people really control um, their lives. I think that the first people who should read this book are our brothers and sisters in the United States because their threat is in their own house. The devil is right at home. The devil, the devil himself is right in the house. And the devil came here yesterday. I think we could call a psychiatrist to analyze yesterday's statement made by the President of the United States. As the spokesman of imperialism, he came to share his nostrums to try to preserve the current pattern of domination, exploitation, and pillage of the peoples of the world. What you just heard is an excerpt of a well-known speech Chavez gave in 2006 at the United Nations in New York, calling George Bush the devil, which is ironic given how Chavez himself was essentially portrayed in much of the media coming out of Washington and London. So where did this diabolical image come from? I want to probe into Chavez's relationship with the foreign and domestic media to try and work out how images of foreign leaders are constructed and what purposes they serve. My next guest Alan McLeod wrote a whole PhD on what he calls the mediatic coup against Chavez. His book is called Bad News from Venezuela, 20 Years of Fake News and Misreporting. Alan, thanks for joining me on the show. Chavez himself, when he was alive, talked about a psychological war that the oligarchy raised. Why do these media narratives exist? I suppose there's a geopolitical and economic aspect to the coverage, a context which is rarely talked about uh, in the media. But uh, Chavez in particular was the leader of a, a Latin America-wide rebellion against a US dominated, uh, the US-dominated world system. And this meant using Latin America's massive resources to help the people of Latin America, not international corporations. And this sparked a huge uh, uproar in Washington, frankly. And so there's the geopolitical aspect to it. Um, the media has generally followed the, the line of the US government. So one fairness and accuracy reporting study found that 90% of uh, the articles on Chavez displayed open hostility towards him. They also treated him as a buffoon and like a very cartoonishly stupid person, even though he was a university professor and highly educated before he became president. 
the BBC uh, described him as uh, a threat to democracy and compared him to Hitler even in 1999. It's not how it's presented here, but the reality is is that uh, inside Venezuela, the media system is dominated by very large private corporations with links to the uh, the old elite who are still in large part actually control the country in terms of the economics, the society and the culture of Venezuela. So the 2002 coup, that was largely described as a mediatic coup inside Venezuela by ordinary people because the media not only supported the coup but were actually leading it. The, the big newspapers had um, headlines on their front pages saying things like, you know, everybody out in the streets, the final battle will be at the Mimafora's pe uh, presidential palace. There's one famous uh, uh, a headline from El Nacional that says, not one step backwards, telling people, everybody, to get out onto the streets. In fact, the 2002 coup, the uh, headquarters of the coup was actually Gustavo Cisneros' mansion, and he is the owner of the largest uh, media company in Venezuela, Venevision, the largest television network. And um, he was uh, the mastermind, frankly, behind it. And we also know that uh, the US ambassador was at the house of Gustavo Cisneros on that day as well. And there's this really racialized nature to the coverage of Chavez, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Since uh, Christopher Columbus set foot on Venezuela in 1498, Venezuela was really set up as a plantation economy where small numbers of Europeans enslaved large numbers of Africans or Native Americans to produce primary products like uh, sugar or coffee. And that led to a situation where the great Uruguayan writer and poet Eduardo Galeano said that in Venezuela the poor are mostly dark and the dark are mostly poor. Chavez was the first non-white uh, president in the majority non-white country's history. And the 2010 census showed that 60% of Venezuelans say that they have African heritage or come from an African background, and yet Chavez was the first non-white president. The media coverage in Venezuela of Chavez was extraordinary. Um, they were extremely worried about uh, a president coming to power who was not one of them, who, was not, who did not come from the right class, the right race background, and they launched huge racist attacks on him, calling him monkey, ape, etc. It is understood and uh, basically seen as normal that uh, black and chavista are basically an interchangeable concept inside Venezuela. Contested Legacies is supported by Abundance. Abundance has been creating ways for everyone to invest in green and social infrastructure since 2012. They are an alternative finance company, helping anyone invest to deliver the innovative solutions we need for a greener and socially responsible future. And you can get started investing from just £5. To find out more, visit Abundance.org. When investing with Abundance, your capital is at risk. Investments are long-term and may not be readily realisable. Abundance is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. So he comes into power as a leftist, a geopolitical adversary, and the media institutions both within and outside of Venezuela reflect that. But what's going on today in the country, and how does that bear on the decisions he made and the state he crafted in office? To help me answer those questions is Gregory Wilpert founder of VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Gregory, thanks for coming on the show. Given that he was so well-read and that political education was so central to his vision, you know, he was showing up at events and quoting Rosa Luxemburg and he gave Obama a copy of uh, the book Open Veins of Latin America. Do you think he had much foresight about the fact that the success of his program was essentially dependent on a high price of oil? That's a complicated question because on the one hand... Um, I don't think Chavez ever felt that clearly that that his program was dependent on a high price of oil, and the the, the reason for this is, is kind of tricky. Is that there was this illusion uh, back in the early two thousands, you know, when the price of oil started going up, everybody was predicting, and it wasn't just you know Chavez or people around him. I mean, I'm talking about uh, oil economists all around the world were predicting that the price of oil 
would continue to go up, 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 up. I remember books coming out even talking about the uh, price of oil reaching $200 uh, per barrel. You know, there was all this talk about Hubbard's peak, which is this, uh, this idea that uh, new oil fields were not being discovered, and so we were produ kept on, and that the you know the world but kept on producing more oil, but was discovering less oil, and so the price would inevitably have to keep going up. And that was a profound miscalculation. Now, it wasn't, in other words, it wasn't so much the idea that the program depended on pri high price, it, it eventually did, but uh, that was never really articulated or conceived of. So in that sense, I guess you're right. Uh, but the idea that the price of oil would not go down was incredibly ingrained, not just in Chavismo, it was mm. everywhere at that time. So, I mean, one, one of the things is actually when Chavez first came into office, he, he uh, that, that idea wasn't so prevalent, actually. Uh, matter of fact, you know, the price of oil was close to or below ten dollars per barrel when he first came into office. So there was a clear uh, at that time that wasn't the, the predominant idea that it would keep going up. But uh, and so he had I, uh, this idea of creating a sovereign wealth fund for Venezuela because uh, the predominant idea at that time was the price of oil was very uh, very volatile and would always go up and down. And so they wanted to create a system where there would be a savings account and uh, that the government would only draw on it when the price of oil went down and when the price of oil went up, it would uh, uh, a certain percentage would go into this sovereign wealth fund. And that was a very smart idea, very good. It was really a very well worked out uh, plan. Unfortunately, when uh, the economic situation changed and uh, people thought the price of oil would never go down, Chavez didn't see the need for the so a sovereign wealth fund and dismantled it. How do you position the current sitting president, Nicolas Maduro, as a successor to Chavez? And what's at stake if Chavismo can't recover from this political crisis? Well, I think uh, Maduro is certainly a very loyal follower of Maduro. I'm uh, sorry, Maduro is a very loyal follower of Chavez. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think he's definitely trying to adhere to you know, Chavez as much as possible. The, the problem is that I think he's almost too much. In other words, I, I think he needed to, uh, given the very different situation that he found himself with a very dramatically declining oil price, very dramatically increasing international and domestic pressure against him, um, a very different economic situation overall. Uh, he should have, I think, adjusted uh, the economic program and the economic policies much more dramatically than he did uh, to the new circumstances. And that was, I think, uh, Maduro's uh, biggest failing. I think Chavez himself was much more flexible in that sense. Uh, Chavez would adapt to changing circumstances very relatively quickly. Uh, he would take in a lot more uh, diversity of input in terms of uh, you know, advice from different people and, uh, and then act accordingly. Uh, Maduro, in, in comparison, is surrounded by all the same advisors. He doesn't take outside advice and uh, he's relatively rigid in that sense uh, in terms of just sticking to the uh, program that had been laid out. In terms of what's at stake for the future, uh, of course, the entire Bolivarian revolution and project is, uh, is, is, is in danger of being lost because one of the main objectives, of course, of the opposition to Maduro and of the United States is uh, to completely uh, wipe the Bolivarian revolution and all Chavistas from, uh, from the political landscape in, in Venezuela. Uh, they don't want a gradual transition to, uh, you know, to... Or, or an alternation in power. No, they want a complete uh, kind of uh, counter-revolution, basically. My last guest is Eva Gollinger, a lawyer who served as an informal advisor to Chavez, accompanied him on parts of his quote-unquote Axis of Evil tour, and wrote a number of books on his time in power, including Bush vs. Chavez, Washington's War on Venezuela, and a newly released memoir, Confidant of Tyrants, Tyrants in quote marks, of course. Eva, thanks for joining us. How did you go from being a spectator to that revolution to a direct and informal advisor to Chavez himself? I came back to New York. I finished my law degree. And while I was in law school was when, you know, I, I was always going back to Venezuela and I was watching um, the process of the creation of the new constitution. And so one of Chavez's 
promises, campaign promises, was precisely to draft a new constitution in a very participatory way. It was an unprecedented, at least at that time in Latin America, or in this hemisphere, uh, process of participation in drafting this constitution at the grassroots level. You know, you didn't have to be a scholar or a lawyer or a politician to participate. This was done at the community level with input from anyone and everyone who wanted to participate. And the end result was voted in a national referendum in 1999. Over 80% voted yes to ratify that constitution. At that time, the U.S. wasn't as hands-on, certainly not as much as they are now, but they were, you know, encouraging the um, opposition to Chavez. And it was really witnessing that process that here you have this very progressive government uh, just beginning, you know, implementing the this incredible array of new rights for the people, new policies that are, are aiming towards redistribution of the nation's wealth, which is the right of the people, in order to provide them with basic fundamental services like healthcare and education and housing and, and food. And then to see this... Um, very, uh, you know, aggressive opposition building up around him coming from the wealthy upper classes. It couldn't have been more explicit that, you know, they were fighting against the social justice reforms, fighting against, you know, reduction of poverty and and the provision of basic necessary services to the people of the country. And what was he like as an individual? How does the dictator Petro populist narrative square with your years of working alongside him? So Chavez had a very powerful um, magnetism and certainly, you know, an incredible leadership capacity who was extremely vilified in most international media. And I ended up, you know, with an invitation on his uh, plane to go to his Sunday show. His son, he always had a television and radio show on Sundays called Hello, Mr. President or Hello, Presidente, and where he engaged with the public over a period of hours. Um, anyway, on the plane, I got on the plane, I had these documents, long story short, because that's in my book. Essentially, I was very nervous about meeting him and providing this information, didn't know what was happening. I was on his, his airplane um, with a bunch of his security and his, his cabinet ministers. And I, I didn't see him. I didn't know what was going on. And towards the end of the flight, his his assistant came out and called me back to his private room. And Chavez was sitting there at this table. And, and I'm coming in with my briefcases full of these documents, completely stressed out about, you know, explaining this information and how much time I had left to do it on this short flight. And he looks at me and he says, have you had breakfast? You know, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not thinking about food. You know, I got to tell you about these documents. He says, no, 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 let's just talk. Let's have breakfast. And we just sat there eating and he starts asking me about my family and my mom and how's my mom and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? I'm here to explain this information. And he just, he just wanted to talk. I mean, it's very personable. It, it, is my sort of point here is that, you know, despite this image that was projected and, and so distorted in the media, you know, he was a very down to earth guy and he cared a lot about people. I believe for the most part of his government was working selflessly for the good of his people. The longer he became entrenched in power, the more difficult it was for him to extract himself from that power. And the more he became, he started to believe that he was an essential part of you know the the suck the success and prosperity of his country and i think that that was that's an error success of a movement or a political process cannot be dependent upon one person or else it's not a movement because i think by sort of imparting his power onto maduro he created essentially a monster who who now believe i mean and i say that in a way that you know is is symbolic in the sense that Maduro believes that, you know, basically Chavez as their, their, and they refer to him as this eternal supreme leader, which is language that I disagree with, but saying, you know, essentially he believes that he, it's like a, a divine right that Maduro has as the leader of the movement. And so therefore anything and everything he's doing is justified, even, you know, the corruption or the, the poor decision making um, that has really created a disastrous economic situation in the country. It's interesting. One of the assumptions I started out with in this episode was that whatever went wrong with Chavismo, the Venezuelan state morphed into something that wasn't genuinely socialist anymore. 
democratic socialists, especially those in the West, gain nothing from trying to distance their project from Chavez. Renationalizing assets within market capitalism, where global prices tumble and rise, and trying to slap away electoral interference aren't uniquely Venezuelan problems. Today, questions of resource sovereignty and wealth redistribution have resounding relevance all over the world. One of the lessons of the failed coup in 1992 is in those words that Chavez uttered. Comrades, unfortunately for now, the objectives we establish were not achieved. Now is the time to reflect, and there will be new situations and the country must definitively head toward a better destiny. Political projects with goals as ambitious as freeing nations from extractive imperialism have the right to fail, to correct and reinvent themselves, to reflect and adapt new strategies. I think really understanding the profound weight of that, por ahora, for now, is an invaluable lesson for social movements around the world, to build longevity, to reflect, to gain confidence in political literacy. In those decades of the Latin American dictatorships, the left was thought to be wiped out, but then rose again with the pink tide, kept alive all those years through mass social movements, clandestine organising, sometimes through brute force, and sometimes by reading Bolivar in cramped apartments in the barrios. In his introduction to the book The Bolivarian Revolution, Hugo Chavez writes, I awake every hundred years when the people awake, as El Libertador says in a poem by the great Pablo Neruda. The Venezuelan people have once again taken up that project, and with them the peoples of Latin America and of the world. They are waging a new struggle for a world of equals, a world of justice. The better world we want to construct is no longer only possible, but is absolutely essential. Things cannot continue as they are. Either we change the world, or it will end. This is something I am sure Bolivar would have understood, that since he was always thinking of the destiny of the Americas and the world in the centuries to come, his project was always oriented toward the future. It was not possible then, but the future is now. There is no time to lose. I'm your host, Husna Rizvi. If you liked this episode of Contested Legacies, do find us on the new Internationalist Patreon and make a monthly contribution. Subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And leave us a review. It helps us to attract other listeners. Next time on the show, I'll be profiling the most influential figure within non-violent mass movements, born 150 years ago this year, Mahatma Gandhi. See you then.